And then next up is class Osteichthys, which is the bony fish. So Oste refers to the fact uh, that they have bones like the rest of animals, bones that you think of. When you think bones, you think of your own bones, these hard, nice, calcium-rich bones. Um, these bones, are the, uh, an actual bone cell is called an osteocyte. So the prefix osteo refers to, to that type of bone. And so osteichthys, oste bone ichthys fish. Uh, amazingly enough, a cartilage cell is called a chondrocyte. Chondra prefix means cartilage. Ichthys means fish. Cartilaginous fish. Bam. So osteichthys. Again, these fish have jaws. And they have bones like ours. Uh, they're calcified bones. They have a lateral line system, just like the sharks. And osteichthys have what we call an operculum. The operculum is sort of a protective plate that covers up the gills. And it allows a fish to sort of open or shut the, uh, the covering for its gills. And so with fish, they take water in through their mouth, and they pass it across their gills, and then they can open their opercula to allow the water to flow past. And so they get water movement over their gills when they swim around with their mouth open. But if a fish is standing still, it can do this with its operculum. And that pumps water over its gills. So osteichthys can stay still. Chondrichthys do not have an operculum. That means they have no method of pumping water over their gills when they stay still. So if they're not in an area of high current that passes water over their gills for them, then they cannot sit still. If they sit still, they'll suffocate. So sharks tend to be constantly in motion because they have to move to breathe. Whereas osteichthys can hang out in one spot and pump their operculum to breathe. So operculum is cool. It protects the gills and it allows them to pump water across the gills so they can stand still. Osteichthys also have a swim bladder. A swim bladder is a, a hollow organ that's inflatable in fish. And so fish pull oxygen out of the water in order to breathe and they pull the oxygen into the blood. The blood can take the gases from the water, the oxygen, the carbon dioxide, and the nit nitrogen that they get out of the water and they can fill up their swim bladder. And if they fill it up with air, the fish will start to float. And if they collapse it and drain the blood into their, or drain the gas into their blood and then out of their gills, then they will start to sink. And so osteichthys can vary where they are in the water by inflating or deflating their swim bladder. And in fact, when an osteichthys fish dies, its swim bladder uh, will end up swelling up with gas, and the swim bladder is generally ventrally located, so they'll float belly up. So, it inflates or deflates with air to control buoyancy. Buoyancy is whether or not or how well something floats in water, whether something's floating or sinking, and just how much floating or sinking it's doing. Most fish use their swim bladder to maintain neutral buoyancy, meaning that they will not float or sink. Wherever they are in the water, they're just going to stay there unless they voluntarily move. So, helps them stay still in one spot. Chondrichthys do not have a swim bladder, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Osteichthys can be divided into two different groups. The ray finned fish, which is nearly all fish. Uh, here's uh, some examples of ray finned fish that I have in my fish tank. So, this is a pearl grommy right here. This is a Cynodontus catfish. Here's a red blue Colombian tetra. Here's a royal Farlowella. This is a half banded spiny eel. This is a Mokulamabimbe biker eel that I have in my 75 gallon. These are black skirt tetras. Um, so I have all of these in my fish tank in the other room there. 
and these are ray-finned chondrichthines. So, pretty cool. Uh, and then we also have the lobe-finned fish. The lobe-finned fish are uh, interesting, to say the least. Uh, there are two remaining lineages of lobe-finned fish. The coelacanths and the lungfish. Uh, the lobe-finned fish gave rise to the tetrapods. They're the uh, closest living common ancestor to the tetrapod fish. Um, tetrapod fish are all extinct. There's none left. Uh, but the tetrapod fish had four limbs that they could support themselves on land were. And the tetrapods that exist now are all terrestrial organisms for the most part. Uh, you know, there's the humans, amphibians, reptiles, mammals. They're all tetrapods. They have four limbs, arms, and legs. So all terrestrial four-limbed vertebrates share uh, the closest common ancestor they have in fish are the lobe-finned fish. So uh, the top left three images, so or the leftmost images here and then top right image here, these are all coelacanths. These are lobe-finned fish, which are pretty cool. Um, these are amazing. If you look at how big they can get, they can get to the size of a man or larger. They're very slow, deep water fish. They've been around for a long, long time. Um, they're an ancient lineage. Uh, and it's actually really cool because we only recently found them in the 1980s. We thought that anything like the coelacanth had been extinct for millions upon millions of years. And then in the 80s, when someone was diving quite deep off the coast of Africa somewhere, they found coelacanths. And so you can actually, well, scientists can actually go out and dive and find coelacanths, living uh, legends there. And then down here at the bottom right is somebody's captive African lungfish. This is also a lobe-finned fish. Um, uh, African lungfish actually has specialized structures for breathing air, which is pretty darn cool if you ask me. All right. That's enough of the fish. So now we've gotten through class Agnatha, uh, class Chondrichthys, and class Osteichthys. We've gotten through the tunicates and the lancelets. Now it's time for class Amphibia. Class Amphibia is, amazingly enough, the amphibians. These are frogs, toads, salamanders, and newts. Um, these are most likely uh, the amphibians we have today are the closest living relatives to the first terrestrial vertebrates. Um, so amphibians, uh, the, the first bony animal to walk on land was thought to have been an amphibian. Nothing that's alive today, obviously, but they share common ancestry with that original terrestrial vertebrate amphibian, which is pretty cool. Amphibians are, of course, tetrapods. They have front and back legs, and they ex exhibit both aquatic and terrestrial adaptations. Uh, frogs have, uh, you know, adult amphibians have webbed feet. They all have eyes capable of underwater sight, and they have extremely thin skin. Most frogs can actually breathe through their skin. Their skin is so thin and they have a lot of capillaries, a lot of very tiny blood vessels running in that thin skin that oxygen can actually go from the water into the blood vessels through that very thin skin. Um, that very, very thin skin is one of the reasons why amphibians need water. Uh, thin skin does not hold water inside the body very well. Amphibians are susceptible to drying out. It's only when you see toes that have very thick, sort of bumpy skin um, that's uh, evolved to protect them from drying out, where you see them uh, living a more terrestrial life. Frogs always live by water because their, thin is, their skin is thin enough that they'll dry out if they're out of water too long. What's cool about amphibians is that they're the only vertebrates 
that undergo a larval and adult stage. Their larval stage is what everybody nicely refers to as the tadpole. Frogs, toads, salamanders, and newts all have a larval stage. Um, in frogs and toads, we call it the tadpole. Uh, and the tadpole is purely aquatic. And it has a tail. It looks, uh, it has a little big head and then a tail. And it just swims around and eats. It generally eats algae or tiny little aquatic invertebrates. And its whole job is to avoid getting eaten and eat enough food so that it can get enough energy to metamorphose. And when a, a larval amphibian undergoes metamorphosis, instead of doing something like an insect where they make a cocoon and they're sort of stuck for a while, what they do is they sort of grow out the adaptations that they'll need for terrestrial life. So they'll get little limb buds growing and they'll start to grow back legs and as their legs get bigger as their front and back legs get bigger their tail reduces in size i've got a very cool picture of amphibian metamorphosis anyway the larval stage uh, you have aquatic eggs like fish that hatch into tadpoles and these have gills uh, fins and a swimming tail and they have no legs and then in, during metamorphosis, the gills disappear as the lungs develop. And the tail shortens up and the limbs begin to grow. First the rear limbs, then the front limbs. And then eventually the tadpole transitions to a terrestrial-based life cycle. Um, and so most adult amphibians live on land, which is pretty darn cool. Um, this makes amphibians uh, an indicator species. They're very susceptible to, uh, when we say indicator species, again, what we mean is, uh, so this is non-testable stuff, but it's important stuff nonetheless. Amphibians are an environmental or ecological indicator. Um, when something goes wrong in an ecosystem, uh, when an ecosystem is getting unhealthy, it is amphibians that are usually the most susceptible to uh, changes like that because of their dual life cycle, because they're exposed to both the water and the land, because they have a larval gill breathing stage and an adult stage, um, and because that adult stage often has very, very thin skin that doesn't block out pollutants very well. So amphibians are very susceptible to environmental shifts. If you want to know whether or not pesticides are starting to damage an ecosystem, Look to the amphibians. Um, that pesticides can often interfere with amphibian metamorphosis. Uh, high enough pesticide doses tend to produce amphibians with extra legs. So they'll have five, seven legs uh, that, you know, and, and it's not, you know, useful legs. It's more like mutant legs that are all malformed and sticking out of weird places. Um, but that's a great indicator that something's gone horribly wrong. And you'll see those effects in an amphibian long before you see those effects in the ecosystem at large. So we call amphibians an indicator. Um, and just uh, to feel good about how well humans are taking care of the Earth, um, amphibians, I think something like 90% of amphibian species are declining, uh, meaning that they are uh, decreasing in population. So the amphibians are all dying off at record numbers, which is kind of scary. So, you know, do something about it. So here are some good amphibians. Here's a little tree frog that lives in trees, and here's a newt. Here's a common toad, and here's a salamander. Uh, and they're all pretty adorable. Um, in general, a salamander is terrestrial, and a newt is aquatic. Uh, that's one of the easiest ways to tell a difference between a newt and a salamander, but that's in general again. So here is a nice little picture of metamorphosis. So you can see at the beginning we have the tadpole with the long tail, and then limbs start to grow, and we develop into an adult frog. So that's pretty cool. This is an African clawed frog, Xenopus levis. So pretty neat to check out there and that's that's metamorphosis that just happens as they get enough energy 
as they get enough food and they they just start to grow out their limbs and grow lungs and their eyes shift in their skull and everything it's very cool the dual life stages of the amphibians so appreciate it all right so the amphibians are the first step onto land our terrestrial life stage now the next evolutionary step is to develop something that is actually capable of living out its entire life on land um, and to do that you have to have eggs that do not need to be laid in water um, and animals that lay eggs that do not require water are called amniotes. Reptiles, birds, and mammals are amniotes, and they have the amniotic egg. This is an egg that is filled with fluid, so the egg has all the fluid the developing embryo needs. Um, and it has a waterproof shell. Because of this, no larval stage is required. The young hatch as completely terrestrial organisms. Class Reptilia is a great example of an amniote. Um, they are snakes, lizards, turtles, crocodiles, alligators, and birds. And even dinosaurs uh, can be thrown in as Reptilia, even though there's a large number of differences between dinosaurs and the reptiles we think of now. Uh, so. The hallmark adaptations of class reptilia are waterproof skin. These are animals that will not dry out if left out of water. They may die of dehydration because, well, everything needs to drink water, um, but uh, they won't lose their water through their skin like an amphibian will. They have hard protective scales on their body, and they have shelled amniotic eggs. Uh, because of these scales and that thickness of their skin allowing it to be waterproof, they can no longer breathe through the skin. So reptiles have a much more developed pair of lungs than amphibians. The non-bird reptiles are all ectotherms. Ecto is a prefix meaning outside, therm, temperature. What this generally means is that non-bird reptiles, their body temperature is determined by the outside temperature. We call them cold-blooded. Uh, cold-blooded organisms regulate their body temperature through behavior. If they're too cold, they sit out in the sun and absorb light and heat from the sun. And if they're too hot, they go into the shade and cool off. Um, and so it's purely the environment that affects their body temperature. Uh, they need roughly 90% less food than warm-blooded organisms. Um, so turtles, lizards, snakes, alligators, and crocodiles, these can all go uh, weeks without eating. Don't recommend it. Uh, the snake in th that CCD owns, um, we we feed him once a week in general uh, and that's all he needs because believe it or not maintaining a constant body temperature costs a ludicrously large amount of energy and so we need to eat a ton because of our body temperature but maintaining a constant body temperature also gives you much higher levels of activity so we can move around a lot more easily. So here's a variety of non-bird reptiles. There's a sea turtle, there's a desert tortoise, there's a regular little turtle, some lizards like a chameleon, uh, and here's two little colorful lizards, and then we have alligators and crocodiles exemplified in these pictures, and then we have the snakes, which are limbless. Um, but they evolved from reptiles that had legs. They just lost their limbs. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, there was a period of time in Earth's history when reptiles dominated the planet. Uh, for 185 million years, the dominant or most visible uh, animal life on the planet was reptiles, specifically the dinosaurs. Um, 
Anymore, just to show you that biology is dynamic, there's people who classify dinosaurs as a subclass of reptiles, and there's people who classify dinosaurs as class dinosauria. And so it's not, you know, there are people saying dinosaurs were their own class, and there are people who group dinosaurs under class reptilia. We're going to go ahead and group dinosaurs under class reptilia, uh, because that's the way the book does it, although I'm more inclined to classify dinosaurs under their own class personally. But um, we're going with dinosaurs falling under class reptilia for you. Because honestly, that's still in flux. It's still in debate. So dinosaurs ruled the planet for 185 million years. And these were the largest terrestrial organisms that ever existed. We called them megafauna which is an awesome word if you ask me. So the megafauna, we're talking dinosaurs like Diplodocus, which reached 70, 80 feet long. Uh, I think there's like Seismosaurus, which was over 100 feet long, or maybe that was just the most massive dinosaur. Tyrannosaurus was a terrestrial predator that was 40 feet long and 18, you know, 16 to 20 feet tall. These were giant organisms. And the half-life of DNA is, unfortunately, something like 30,000 years. So it's unlikely that you will ever see science resurrecting dinosaurs. Sorry. Because all dinosaurs died. 65 million years ago. Well, except one type of dinosaur, the birds. That's right, birds fall under Dinosauria, which is pretty awesome. This is Dinosauria, subclass Dinosauria, and if you look at Dinosauria, it gave rise to all of the dinosaurs. And then along here is birds under dinosauria, which is pretty sweet.